Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Hey, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. New book today, Habakkuk. Habakkuk uh, in the Hebrew tongue means to embrace. And I, I like it because it applies in more ways than one. You can be embraced by and enfold, enfolded within God's word as a protection around you, a shield, a wall. It's called wisdom and it's called knowledge that helps you know beforehand where the pitfalls in life are. But at the same time, in this first chapter, we'll be discussing a net. And it is, there, there is a net in this world that can embrace you also, and it's cast out by Satan when he does his fishing. So it's not only Christians that fish for men. Satan loves it, along with his little disciples also. When you embrace God's word, Habakkuk, and place it around your mind and pack your mind in that wisdom, you're too sharp to swim into one of his little nets. So, having said that, probably I should say that Habakkuk was written about the same time that Jeremiah was written, at the reign of Jehoiakim and uh, uh, Jehoiakim, uh, Joash, just um, uh, you'll, about that same time. And he's warning of the Chaldean, which is to say, the Babylonian captivity. Good warning, too, because it is written in the prophetic sense for you in this generation when the king of Babylon is about to come again. Okay, chapter 1 and verse 1, a word of wisdom from our father. And verse 1 reads, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And the emphasis certainly is on the burden, meaning it's a heavy one. Verse 2. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? How long is it going to be before you help us? Well, naturally, when this uh, basically covers Judah, when you observe what was happening in that nation at this time, it's obvious why God didn't hear the prophet. Verse 3. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention, seem like just troublemakers popping up on, uh, at every corner. Um, will this always be with us? Well, yes, basically it will. But you don't have to root around in it. You don't have to put up with it. That's what God's word is for, is the set of instructions for life to keep you out of the turmoil, to keep you out of the strife, the contention. You can be smarter than that. I'll put it that way rather than to say wiser than that. God's wisdom lets you know beforehand what happens in the world if you uh, are blind spiritually. Verse 4. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. It, um, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. It's kind of saying here the, the, the law being slacked, it's numb also. And really, um, when you live in a country where it could be a lot worse, but when you live by a law of precedent rather than fact, it leaves the little worm a place to always wiggle. And unfortunately, if you've got enough money, you can do a lot of worm wiggling. I think that's self-explanatory. This really looks past, if you would, um, the 
present time, even to the time that you know who is judging the false Christ. You with companion Bibles, with this and the next verse, you'll be made aware of that, that it also warns of the futurist, that is to say, antichrist that shall come, and his judgment is upside down compared to our fathers. Verse 5, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. In other words, um, I'm going to do something that's never been done before. And of course, that's Satan being kicked out of heaven as Antichrist, Revelation 12, 7. Do you know that Paul quoted this in Acts chapter 13, verse 41, giving the same warning? So, yep, Paul quoted Habakkuk. The embracer. See that you always embrace the Lord and his word rather than being swept away or netted by false teachings in the net of Antichrist. Verse 6. For lo, I, this is being, it's emphatic, I raise up the Chaldeans, that's to say the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And so it is. Unfortunately, land claims that are not pertinent, land claims that are not true. And when you look at Satan as Antichrist standing on Jerusalem where he ought not, that's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When you see that, flee Judea. In other words, know that the Antichrist is on his way. Mark chapter 13, Matthew chapter 24. Verse 7. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. They, they do uh, as they wish and it would seem nobody can stop them. But you see, what is comforting about that is when you're familiar with it prophetically and you know the movement of the nations and who controls what, then it's a comfort because you know God's word, if, if it strengthens God's word to the fact that it shows you he knew exactly what he was talking about and it's, that is a foolish statement in a sense because naturally he does, he planned it. It is his plan, and it's naturally going to go the way he states it will. Verse 8, their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more furious than the evening wolves. They're keener, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Why? What is it talking about? What? Come from far. One worldism from all over the world. The, um, the four hidden dynasties at this time are surfacing. If you, if you have eyes to see, it isn't too difficult. Probably I could say the one that's showing its fangs more than probably others is the hidden dynasty of the economy. It's all wired together, friend. All of it. And what is amazing, well, I probably shouldn't go into this, but what's, I'll, I'll go, uh, the, we have a middle bank. It's called the inner middle uh, uh, facility, IMF, all right? And it's a fund so that if somebody trips, if they mess up, they let some greedy official rip off the nation, the good old American taxpayer through the inner middle facility, the IMF, makes up the difference. I think they hit us this past, this week for about 18 B, 18 billion that is. But you know, hey, what's the sign? We're there, wake up. Verse nine, they shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they're that eager and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. In other words, they're, they're going to take as the sands of the sea. 
the membership that is deceived by that one world system under the spurious Messiah, spurious Jesus, unfortunately many that are Christian will think he is Jesus. You know why? They've never really studied the word of God. They've been pacified with, oh, you don't need to know that. Just believe. Well, if you're not careful and you haven't been taught that the spurious Messiah, that's to say the false Jesus comes first, and all you're taught to do is to believe, you're not going to know who to believe in when he sets foot here performing miracles before anybody goes anywhere. Verse 10. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Heap dust simply means the old, like the, here's a wall. They just push up dirt and walk over it. That simple. Verse 11. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Going to say, he did it. He made me do it. He does it. He gives me blessings. And it's going to appear very strong, my friend, when it actually comes to pass. Verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord God, mine holy one? And Habakkuk cries to the Father. We shall not die, or you might say, who shall not die, O Lord? Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. And, and this, is what, this is why the king of Babylon was allowed to conquer the house of Judah at the, in the first time, but in the end times, last times, it's the same reason God allows the spurious Messiah to come as a correcting staff to find out who is and who isn't. Who is and who isn't what? Ignorant of God's word. He sent the instructions, the warnings. They're well written. If you've taken a moment, a child can understand them. I, I know that I have received letters saying, I wish you'd stop saying a child could understand because I can't. Well, don't make the word complicated because it is so simple a child can understand the Word of God, if they listen to the Word rather than allowing old recap traditions to slip in and fuzz the mind, 13, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. You can't stand sin. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked, the rasha, rasha, that's the wicked one, the Antichrist, that's one of his names, devoureth the men that is more righteous than he. You just let the Antichrist walk over. No, Antichrist doesn't walk over God's elect. We have power over all of our enemies, and he knows it. Verse 14, and make us men, that's to say Adam, as the fishes of the sea as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. Have you ever seen a little old school of fish in the, in the ocean or the sea? You know, if one turns, they all turn. Just no, no great big leader up at front. It's just axiomatic. You know, they all turn. One zips into the net, they all do, okay? It's called follow the leader. If some believe a certain thing or got the guts to stand up and declare a certain thing, they're, not, they're being biblically illiterate. They don't know whether it's of God's word or not. They just, like a little school of fish, the sign of Christianity, zip right in there, all happy, right into the net, embraced by it. 15. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. I mean, they just make a clean sweep over all people with lies and false teaching. Are you getting the hint as to why the, what the final conflict will be with the king of Babylon? It's a revival. It's religion. He's fishing for sinners. 16. Therefore, the, they sacrifice unto their net. That's their religion. And burn incense unto their drag holy to them because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous 
I mean, they, in other words, they worship the God of forces. If you can force them in there, take them. It's the same God of forces you'll read of in Daniel chapter 11. Same old spurious Jesus. Same old spurious Messiah. Not our Lord, the fake. And he comes first. Are you ready for him? 17. Shall, there, there, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Now you know we're not talking about fish. We're talking about nations. Are, are you going to let this just continue on? God has told you exactly how long he'll let it continue on. For you that have eyes to see and ears to hear through his word. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will, the, the prophet continues, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, that's the watch tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. In other words, I am a watchman, this prophet says, I'm going to get up on that watch tower on that wall and I'm going to listen for God's answer to this and when I get it, I'll publish it. I'll make it well known. And here, what, what do we have? We have a watchman looking for help. And that's what God's elect are in this generation, the generation of the fig tree. They are watchmen. And you're supposed to be watching the signs, the seasons, the movements of the nations as they zig and zag out of the little nets. And as you recognize the nets and of entrapment from the four hidden dynasties, we'll get more into those dynasties when we get into the book of Zechariah uh, in, in the closing of these minor prophets, and that won't be far in the distance. Like I've told you, the minor prophets are like tomorrow's newspaper. This one said, I will observe. Uh, what, is, what does this show you? You see, it would seem that some people... They like to make a prayer to God about what is wrong and what's happening to our people, and they want results instantly. They want an answer now, God. God expects you to have patience. After you've made your petition, then you, um, as you wait patiently, that shows also faith because you, Habakkuk knew God would answer him or give him a sign of some nature that Habakkuk would have his answer. But when you're serving God, there's one thing you want to learn pretty early, and that is that you wait on him. He's not going to wait on you, all right? You, that's what a servant should do. You wait on the master. When he's ready to... Um, to uh, send you a message. He's got your address. He knows right where you're at. And he knows how to get in touch with you. And he's not bashful, I guarantee you. Verse 2. And the Lord answered me, here it came, and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. I want you to make a huge sign. I want you to make it big enough that everybody can receive the warning. God's going to tell what will happen. Can, the thing is, can you receive it? Can you receive the word of God? He said, I, I, to run that readeth it, run as a messenger to carry and spread the word, to plant the seed. Do you ever do that? Verse 3. And God continues to speak. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, not soon then, but even to this generation, the end. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. It is a prophecy and a vision for the end. That is to say, the end generation, which is the generation that Jesus said he counted as a generation in uh, Psalms 22, the crucifixion psalm. It is the generation of the fig tree whereby it is written in Matthew 24 and uh, in Mark 13 that when you see that generation of the fig tree, all these prophecies would be fulfilled in that one generation. You're in it, friend. Like it or lump it. 
though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God is saying, you can count on it, the wicked one's coming. Verse 4, behold his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And you better have that faith. You'd better, what, what is faith? Faith is something you believe in. And to believe is to, to know the Father's word whereby you can believe in it. If you don't know what's in the word, then how could you believe on it with intelligence? You couldn't. That would be impossible. Oh, you've got the loonies that'll say, oh, he just gives it to me out here from outer space. Zoop. No, he doesn't. There's only one time he says that he does that, and that's when you're delivered up before the spurious Messiah that you're not to premeditate. But you're supposed to spend a great deal of your time meditating on this word of instructions, or else how do you know how to follow? You'll end up following the little fish right into Satan's net because he comes first. Verse 5. Yea, also, what's more... Because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man. I want you to mark this word man. It's a little unusual. It's Geber. He, he's supernatural. He's a man of sin. He's the wicked one. He's the wicked counselor. He's spurious Jesus. He's the Antichrist. Neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire, that word should be nephesh, soul, in the manuscripts, as hell. Do you know why? And is as death. Why? Because that is his name, death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus names him through Paul. And cannot be satisfied. There's no way you can satisfy the devil. No way you can satisfy the Antichrist but gathereth unto him all nations, that's to say one worldism, and heapeth upon him all people, all that'll swim into his net, all that are biblically illiterate, and do not know that the false Christ comes first, and I'll document that this, who this uh, Geber, this supernatural one is here in just a moment, just bear with me, uh, the only people I, I would not know is so simple that I will say it again. A very young child would understand who the subject matter is here. When I finish with this word, you will see, for you shall see it from the word, not from me. Verse 6. Shall not all these take up a parable? I want you to underline that word parable the same as I want you to underline the word Russia, which is to say the wicked one, which is to say Antichrist. I want you to take up this parable. Because we're going to go to the parable in a moment. Take up a parable against him in a taunting proverb. Remember proverb. Don't forget it against him and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Now, it makes himself look like, you know, we're clay bodies, only he's not. He was never born a woman. And he's kicked out of heaven and he only ladens himself with clay to make it look like he's a human being. Do you know what happens when you put wet clay up on, laden your face? Let's say your face or your arm or your body with it. What happens when it dries? Every time you move, it cracks, it's brittle, and it breaks. That's how easy he is for God's elect that know who he is. We have power over him. It was given to us by Jesus Christ and recorded. It is written in the 10th chapter of the great book of Luke, beginning with the 19th verse. So he's just like a mud stick. If he comes in your house, every time he moves, dirt breaks off and you get dirty. But 
I'll tell you what, he'll get his just reward. That thick clay will end up as exactly that. Don't forget, he's, they're, you're supposed to take up a taunting proverb. Do you know what that proverb is? Hmm? Verse 7. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall uh, and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them when does that come to pass well it's well written you know if you knew the proverb he told you to taunt with you wouldn't have any problem understanding it and I want you to go with me to Isaiah chapter 14 and I'm going to teach you that proverb and that identifies the man the Geba the Ish all right so like I said a little child can understand it so no one need wonder who the false Christ is or who this one that is caked in clay the imposter is chapter 14 the great book of Isaiah and we're going to pick it up with verse 4 and verse 4 reads that thou shalt take up this proverb <gasps> oh there it is well my my you didn't think God's word had let you down against the king of Babylon that's who the Chaldeans are and that was the king that the proverb was against. You got it? That, I mean, that's two and two equal four. Okay? And say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? How did that happen to you, that a great sister Babylon? Confusion. And you're in Babylon if you're in a confused state of mind in regard to God's word, whether you like it or not. I'll say that again. The base prime of Babel and his Babel are confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but peace. And if you are confused about God's word, you are a resident of the end time sister Babylon. Confusion. Especially religious confusion. When you have God's word to straighten you out. Well, here's the proverb, and it's going to tell you exactly who this king of Babylon is. Verse 5, the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked. That's Rasha, the lawless one. And the scepter of the rulers. Those fake rulers are going to go down that he sets over the little fishes. 6, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger, one worldism, is persecuted and none hindereth. They'll all applaud when it comes time to turn on him. Verse 7. The whole earth, how much of it? One worldism, all of it, is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. That is to say, thanksgiving. First day of the millennium, every knee will bow and there will be peace because you'll find out in a moment, we're going to put this sucker somewhere. Verse 8. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Not the truth of the knowledge of good and evil. But the fir tree is symbolic of our people. God himself would say, as you have read, I am a great fir tree, the evergreen, meaning eternal life. Verse 9. Hell, that's to say the grave, from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. We've got it all prepared for you, king of Babylon. But the question still remains. The proverb you're taunting him with uh, is going to name him in a minute. I wonder if you'll recognize him. It stirreth up the dead for thee. That's his cronies. Even all the chief ones. That's the Rehaphim, the Nephilim, the fallen angels of the earth when they're kicked out here. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Boy, what a time this is going to be. Why would Paul repeat that Habakkuk statement in Acts chapter 13? 
because it will be something that has never happened before. It certainly will never happen again either. When Satan is allowed to really correct God's children that claim especially to be Christian and they're in biblical illiteracy, they'll be led down Primrose Lane like a herd of fish. Verse 10, and probably a lot more smelly. Verse 10 reads, all they, all they who? All the dead. All they shall speak. It's like in one voice. And say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, this one, this spurious Messiah, all of a sudden, even the little fishes realize, hey, he's not, he's not anything super. He's cast down just like we are. And they all deserve it. This is the proverb, the taunt. Are you familiar with it? Satan does not like to hear this song. How sharp are you? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Does God lead you or does somebody else? Does some man give you your spiritual food? Or do you get it from the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse? Who is the spurious Messiah? Who is this king of Babylon? Verse 11. Thy pump is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. There's, you just got a blanket of them. That's a good picture of the spiritual degradation that is placed upon this one. Now here is his name, and don't ever forget it. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, there's not a change of subject there. This is the one. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, or morning star? See, as Christ is the true morning star, even his name Lucifer means morning star, bright star, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Well, if you're not biblically illiterate and you've ever read uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, and you haven't let some ignoramus preacher tell you you don't need to understand the book of Revelation, you would know that in Revelation 12, 6, and 7, that Michael cast him out on earth. Uh, that's how he's fallen to the ground. He was kicked out. And there's some more kicking going to take place when he gets here, taking names and kicking dragon. It's going to happen. I just wonder if you want to be in that army. Those that wear the gospel armor will be doing the same. So what is his name? Lucifer, dragon, devil, false Christ, spurious Messiah. They're all one and the same. If you've ever read Revelation chapter 17, they give eight of them there and say they're all the same because he was that one. So he's waiting his time. The king of Babylon is Satan himself, and he comes as Jesus Christ. What an abomination. That's why Jesus calls when you see the abominable one standing in the holy place where he ought not. Flee Judea. Because that time has come, this great event that would happen. Now, did, what is his name? Well, I'll read it again. Old Lucifer. Now, how bright are you? Surely, surely you have spiritual eyes to see that. The proverb against the king of Babylon. What is the king of Babylon's name? Lucifer, devil, dragon. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. There isn't some that would say, well, I just can't believe that. Well, then you don't believe God's word. One that chooses to be dumb, let him be dumb still. God needs servants that have a little bit, very little, usually that can have faith and belief in him because God's children walk by faith, not by sight. Faith in this word, to know to stand against Lucifer, not go to bed with him like the sweet harlot uh, Babylon will do. Little fishes just turn and all jump right in bed with him thinking he's Jesus. Come to a wedding. This is why Jesus would say in Mark 13, Woe to you that are with child when I return. Why? They've already jumped in bed with Satan, the false Christ. Because Jesus makes it very clear in Mark 13, 
not maybe the false Christ Lucifer will come, but that he would come first. I just wonder what that means. I'm sure some are saying that. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe some, maybe you can't be helped. I know most of you see it. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Who said that? Lucifer, Satan, false Christ, playing God, playing Jesus. Have you never read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul says, I don't want you to be anxious about our gathering back to Jesus Christ. It ain't going to happen until after the false Christ stands in Jerusalem, the son of perdition, meaning the son that's already been judged and told he will perish. That's what the word perdition means in the manuscripts. Claiming to be Jesus, letting the little suckers that are biblically illiterate run to him to be flowing away. God's word is so wonderful, isn't it? That it warns you to stay out of a stinking mess like that. To not slide the slippery slope with those slimy little fish into the, a net cast out by this Lucifer. I think God really loves his children that love his word. Verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Let me tell you, there is no way that he can be like the Most High, our loving Father, this Lucifer, this fake star. But a lot of people just love it because of the traditions and the dynasties that he has utilized to work into the religious community to deceive people and to fly by and by when God himself would say in Ezekiel chapter 13, I am against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Have you ever read it? It's there. Ezekiel chapter 13, beginning with verse 18. He said, those churches, so being the daughters, so pillows to cover my outstretched saving arms and teach their flyaway doctrine. It's there, friend. Read it for yourself. <laughs> Don't weep, though, unless you intend to remain ignorant. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, still talking to Lucifer. That's why he's going to be low. 16, they that see thee shall narrowly, this is the millennium now where he's in the pit, Revelation chapter 20, shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man? This is Ish here, not Geba as it was in Habakkuk that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, nations, drew them into one worldism? I don't know, do you know the proverb now? If you do, you'll probably never be deceived by the fake. You're a watchman, and you've known since you were a child there's more to God's word than you'd been taught. In the simplicity, of the flowing truth of God's word. When you let God's word speak instead of man, this man or any other man, don't ever forget who the king of Babylon of this end generation is. It's Lucifer, Satan, dragon. He goes by many names, but you can always recognize him by the simplicity that Christ would teach. He said, if, if you don't understand all of it, just test the fruit of the tree. If it's satanic, it's Satan. If it's sweet, it's of Jesus. All right? But make sure you don't confuse Satan's serpy, sweet goulash with the true saving peace of the Lord God Almighty. All right, there you have it, friend. I don't think God could make it any simpler as to who the king of Babylon in the prophetic sense is. It's Satan. He's going to be kicked out to heaven to reign on this earth for a five-month period, as it's written in Revelation chapter 9. Have you read it? If you haven't, do it. All right. I love you all because you enjoy reading, studying this letter of exactly how things will be, as you even see them at this time, shaping and forming and coming into position for that hour. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?